everyone. Good morning and welcome. Good to be home. Uh, it, it was. Uh, it's always great to go on holidays um, and to have uh, yeah, just a change of pace with family and, and whatnot. My fall, uh, holidays had me adventure up to um, uh, St. Matthew's Cathedral up in Timmins. Our former primate, our Archbishop Fred Hiltz, was looking for some coverage because the priest, who is also a bishop, who is at the cathedral, has had to relinquish her ministry because she has cancer. That is Bishop Victoria Matthews. So please do hold Bishop Victoria in your prayers. And they have very few uh, clergy up in the north. So Archbishop Fred called in a team of bishops and me. <laughs> and it was, it was lovely. It was really lovely. Our girls got to spend um, a three-day weekend in Sudbury to go see Science North and go on a mining tour, and it was lovely, it really was lovely. And last uh, Sunday, I had the privilege of baptizing my niece, uh, Isabel Marjorie Richards, um, at the little church outside of Halliburton that's called St. Peter's Maple Lake. And it's the church where my dad's buried and where mom and dad got married. And my sister and, and her husband, I married them last year at that church, and this is their first child. So it was a, a wonderful time to be bringing them back. And when the Bocott Richards Hamilton family showed up in this little church that seats 50, we brought 25 people. <laughs> the little congregation was pretty excited about it. So, uh, Brian, I'm going to ask if others join us and there's not seats, just to keep an eye out because I've got a couple seats at the back there, just in case we do need them. Uh, before we begin our time of worship, let's share in these community announcements, and we start with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the Anglican Parish of the Blue Mountains is located on the boundary of the Treaty 18 region, and this dates to 1818 and marks the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat Wyandette peoples. Good morning! Come on in! We, uh, in the same way that we have celebrated our Garden of Remembrance, knowing that we have loved ones that are buried here on the sacred property, we acknowledge that there are ancestors who are interred in this land, and we give thanks to God for their remembrance and for their gifts. Let us pray. Creator, let us be of good mind to reconcile the mistreatment of this land and to those who have been displaced. This we pray with thankful and respectful hearts in your name, the Creator, your Son, the Peacemaker, and the Sacred Spirit. Amen. Now I want to uh, start today by saying a big thank you to the leadership team who cared for the needs of our community when I was away on holidays. I want to say a special thank you to Lorena Forsyth, our secretary, and to our wardens who held down the fort, but especially to our worship leaders who included Archdeacon Judy, our licensed lay readers Francis and Laura, our deacons in training Donna and Michelle, uh, because the truth is both the parish and I personally, we are truly blessed to have the leadership gifts of so many. Uh, so I say thank you to them. I also want to say that uh, just recently, Michelle and Donna conducted their first service at Aaron Rung, uh, which was wonderful. Uh, they were accompanied by Janet and a team of uh, Wayne, Richard, and Ruth choristers. So they brought the music. Uh, and it's a wonderful continuation of the ministry that we have from this place being shared with the wider community. So thank you to Donna. And Michelle's probably gone home, but Michelle as well. Upcoming announcements. This upcoming Friday, August 9th, St. George's is delighted to host the Shoreline Chorus's summer concert. It's entitled A Sprig of Time. Under the direction of Anne-Marie McDermott and with special guest Bruce Skelton on violin, the concert will take place this Friday at 7.30 p.m. here at the church. Admission is $25. If you're in town, do come. Uh, they always put on a magnificent concert. Uh, and this is our local community choir that we're supporting. Uh, also to note, please mark your calendars for our upcoming annual community corn roast, which will be hosted on Saturday, August 24th. Uh, we've turned this into a community celebration where we are all enjoying being neighbors together. And we come together with our own chairs, bring your own cups and plates, and we gather on the lawn. And we bring out the old uh, St. George's Cauldron and Merv. Uh, McConnell will be stirring up the corn again this year. Uh, so we'll have corn on the cob with hot dogs and popsicles and beverages. The Royal Canadian Legion will uh, have a bar service on site. 
And this year, all of the proceeds, all the donations that come in for this event will go to support our local Lions Club, a great, another community organization that we're supporting. Uh, kids can come and ring bell, and I usually run around like a person with their head cut off as I give church tours around and around and around. So do invite your friends, make sure you've got it in your calendar, Saturday, August 24th. If you weren't here at 9.30, this morning we had a very special reveal of the monument that's right around the corner of the Garden of Remembrance. Uh, for those who might not be aware, uh, this space that we are in, the two tips of the garden are uh, legal cemeteries, and it's in these two gardens where the ashes of many loved ones have been buried uh, from our St. George's family and some from the wider community. Uh, we just, uh, we haven't dedicated it yet, but we've just revealed the monument with the names of everyone who's been scattered. So if you haven't had a chance to see that, do poke around the corner at, uh, at the end of the service and check out the monument. We will be having an annual service of remembrance in the month of August. And so sometime this month, we will dedicate that new monument. Uh, I'm told that even though it's in September, just to give everyone a heads up, then the first week of September we will be having our parish picnic, but I'll share details of that when we get a little closer to September. Uh, and I'm going to check with the wardens to make sure there are no announcements that I've forgotten. Hearing none. And forever hold your peace. <laughs> Let us pray for peace in the world. St. George's burns our candle of peace inside the church. The sanctuary and the presence lamps burn this month to the glory of God given by the noble family, Anne and Eleanor, in memory of their brothers, Peter and Ron. On the fire side of the church is our candle that, pr that burns as we pray for peace, and let us do so now. Gracious and loving God, our world is torn with war and violence. We pray that you would grant our world a peace that can only be found in you. Let us be mindful at this time of those who are suffering from the results of war and violence. And we remember all those in Ukraine, those innocent victims who are finding themselves in that war in Russia. We pray for all those who are living in the Holy Land, praying for Israel and Gaza. We pray for Haiti, and for all other places of unrest and war in our world. Gracious and loving God, we need your physical and mental healing. We need an end to war and acts of violence. We pray for reconciliation. We pray for an end to the divisions that cause individuals, groups, and nations to fight one another. Lastly, O oh Lord, we pray for your healing to bring to an end the trauma and suffering of so many. And this we pray through the power of your Son, who is the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <coughs> and as we transition into this time of worship, we have our opening prelude by Janet. Music is always so beautiful. Janet, you're accompanied by the cicadas and the birds this morning. <laughs> Please join with me as you are comfortable in standing. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. O come, let us worship the Lord our God. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Fitting for our gathering uh, in this uh, sacred space today, our first hymn is In the Garden. I will say that the first congregation, what you missed out on was... Uh, a little bit of a rain shower. <laughs> so if you've got a little sun next Sunday, bring your hat. Uh, but sometimes you have to bring your raincoat or your towel too. So you never quite know what happens in this space. But uh, let us sing together in the garden. Thank you. 
when we do the service, uh, the monthly service at Aaron Run, that hymn is the favorite hymn of the residents there, and we can't leave that place without singing this hymn. Uh, and, it, and it's remarkable how some who may be in the fog of medications or the fog of, of age, they wake up with this hymn and they sing with us. So it's beautiful, the powerful music. Together, let us step closer to God as we pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Prepare us, O God, to welcome the guests that you are inviting to be embraced, served, and loved by your church. Help us to appreciate the gifts of diversity that each guest will bless us with. May we place the needs of others before our own in order to foster new relationships in you. We pray in the name of Jesus who summons all people to himself. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son Jesus Christ fed the hungry with the bread of his life, and the word of his kingdom. Renew your people with your heavenly grace, and in all of our weakness, sustain us by your true and living bread. This we pray in the name of the one who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to please be seated for the proclamation of God's word. A little wind of the spirit blew through there. <laughs> Can you do the first reading of Monica? <coughs> A reading from the second book of Samuel. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had, had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and he said to him, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up and it grew with, up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in its bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what this evil to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me, have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our psalm this morning is a reading from Psalm 51. The psalm is a prayer for cleansing and for pardon. And please join with me in the parts in bold. The psalmist writes, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sent. And I am what is evil in your sight. So that you are justified in your sentence. And blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty. A sinner when my mother conceived me. Yet, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, I teach you wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Let me hear joy and gladness. Hide your face from my sins. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation. Therefore, I shall teach transgressors your ways. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Wayne, you're up to bat. <laughs> Reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. Unity in the body of Christ. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made a captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the body, the whole body, joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. God. (laughs) 
for our gradual hymn, it is, uh, we've just included a short part of a refrain. And I'm going to sing through the refrain once, and I invite you to join with me in singing it uh, the second time. And then we'll sing it again after the gospel. Please join with me in standing as we sing now in this banquet. So just notice that the first half, the first two lines are exactly the same as the last two. So that makes it easier. And apologies to those with perfect pitch. I'm doing this a half step lower. <laughs> like this. Now in this banquet, Christ is our bread. Here shall all hungers be fed. Bread that is broken, wine that is poured. Love is the sign of our Lord. Together. Now in this banquet, Christ is our The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. On the next day, when the people who remained after the feeding of the 5,000 saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Ver Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, Give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, bless the words of my, how, my mouth. Open all of our hearts that we may receive your holy word. And although sometimes your word is veiled in challenging text and language, help us to see your grace and your mercy within it. This we pray through the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Amen. 
last Sunday, uh, I was preaching at a baptism. Uh, so I was able to set aside the normal scheduled readings that we had for that Sunday. Um, and if you were here last Sunday, likely you'd remember that some of the readings were a little bit on the hard side to listen to. Uh, who read the Old Testament passage last Sunday? Oh, lucky you, Richard. But don't blame me. <laughs> While I was away, uh, I'm part of a number of uh, online conversations of young clergy that talk about preaching, and I was reading the messages of them grumbling about last Sunday's passage and saying, sometimes we need to have a disclaimer on scripture. If a new person is coming to the church and they hear the story of an adulterous relationship, is that really the first impression we want to share with someone who comes in the church? And some of the voices had said, well, you know what, maybe we should just cut those passages out because they're difficult to hear. And when I heard that, I, I immediately thought, well, that's not who we are as Christian people. We don't cut out the difficult parts, but we seek to find God's mercy and wisdom within them. There's actually um, a heresy within the church that's called Marcionism. That's your word for the day, Marcionism. Marcionism's when Christians in the early church thought that they should get rid of parts of the Bible because they didn't like them, or they found them difficult to figure it out. And they realized that the Word of God is revealed in all sorts of scripture in different genres within the Bible. And last Sunday's uh, scripture was a great example of that. So I thought that it would be great for me to not shy away from that and to take a moment to do the deep dive into the story of King David and Bathsheba and to see where God is at work there and how that may be relevant to us today. The story of King David is one that's fascinating because it's scandalous. It's the story of a young boy who was raised up from the poorest to the poor. David is the youngest son of a man who is a shepherd, and he is raised up by God to be king over all of Israel. He comes from modest roots. We hear the, the great epic of David versus Goliath. We hear him grow in wisdom, and suddenly he's a king, and he inherits all of the wealth and the privilege that comes with that role. But at the heart of the story of King David is a man who is human and a man who is tempted as all people are. The downfall of King David is that in his heart of hearts, he's never satisfied with what God has given him. He looks around at things that are not his, and he lusts after them. Now, before I go any further in the story, I'm going to say that the story of Bathsheba is one that is highly offensive to contemporary ears. And there have been all sorts of people who have come up to me after uh, this, these passages and said, oh my goodness, why, do we, why does the Bible depict women in such a negative way? And it is hor horrendous. What I will say is, if you are offended within this text listen to the deeper symbolism of what happens in the story. Don't impress upon it a very literal reading suggesting that God is against women and children and God likes to punish and hurt people. You're missing the point. The Hebrew reading of this even has a playfulness to the opening of this part of David's life. It starts by saying, in the springtime, when kings go out to war, because it's the time that they do that sort of thing, right? There's a little bit of a playfulness because this part of the story is an epic narrative of scandal, intrigue, and of someone who is high that falls very low. That's not to make an excuse for the language uh, around women in some parts of the Bible. Bathsheba is described as an incredibly beautiful woman. And to take her out of context, uh, would be to make her into some sort of seductive harlot character, which she is not depicted in this, these passages. She's depicted as the loving wife of a man not named Uriah the Hittite. Uriah is a very poor man. His greatest treasure is the love of his, wi love of his life, who is his wife, Bathsheba. The prophet Nathan describes Bathsheba like a shepherd that has a very precious you, a precious lamb, and it's the shepherd's sole possession, the greatest thing that he has. King David looks out at the beauty of Bathsheba, and it says that he uses his authority and privilege to take that which is not his. 
it doesn't say that anywhere in the text that Bathsheba has a choice. King David knows that he's doing something wrong and he does it anyways. He sets up a situation where he takes Bathsheba, he takes her to bed, and the, the conclusion of that is she ends up bearing a child. King David is then excited about it because he says, now I have the potential of an heir. But there's one thing that's standing in the way. It's the faithfulness and the legality of her husband Uriah who is described as being a very faithful man to God. Here's a little bit about Uriah. Uriah travels. At this time, God was in the Ark of the Covenant, which was carried from place to place, and they had a tent, not dissimilar to this one, that was carried with the Ark of the Covenant. Uriah was one of the servants of that tent, and when he comes to his hometown, and the tent is parked outside of the, the, the village, he doesn't go home to his wife and family, he stays with God in the tent because he is so pious. He is so faithful in serving God that he will not leave God alone in the tent. So this is the quality, the character of life that Uriah is. King David says, well, this guy's in the way. I need to remove him so I can marry uh, Bathsheba and have an heir by the child that she's now bearing. So he sits up... A scenario where Uriah is placed in an impossible position where he inevitably loses his life. At the end of this, King David, who was raised up as a poor shepherd's son, revels in the fact that he has tricked everyone. He's got everything that he wants and more. But the message of the story is that if it stopped there, it would suggest that kings, presidents, people in power and authority can walk all over everyone and take whatever they want. But that's not the type of God that lives and acts in the world today. We hear that God sees through all of the deception, and the voice of God in this passage is a prophet by the name of Nathan. God tells Nathan that King David has done this horrendous act and he appeals to Nathan to reach out to the king. Now, it's pretty dangerous criticizing the king for anything because he can put you to death, even if you're a prophet. So Nathan comes to King David and he tells a parable. Now, you were raised as a young poor shepherd's son. This should make sense to you, he says. There was a young shepherd that was poor. And he had one possession in his life, which was his beautiful ewe that he buys and he raises it like a daughter. He loves this one animal. Then a rich man comes to town and he wants to host a party, but he doesn't want to sacrifice any of his own sheep. So he steals the poor shepherd's sole possession so that everyone can have a feast at his party. Now King David's not an idiot, he's only a partial idiot. He's not, uh, an idiot in the sense that he says, wait a second, this is a parable that represents real life. And then he asks Nathan, he says, who was the man that did this thing? Let me know and I will bring down on him the king's justice. Because he's done this, I'm going to put him to death. And then Nathan says, you're the man. And you can't make things right. Because the man that you'd like to settle up with, you've also put to death. You are the poor shepherd that was raised up to be king over Israel. And then when God gives you commandments, you break three of them. He bears false witness. He's an adulterer. And he commits murder. How the mighty have fallen. So you may ask, why the heck do we have a story like this in the Bible? One that depicts one of God's chosen leaders to be such a schmuck to have such evil in his heart that he destroys a family and he kills a man. Well, the reason why the story is in it is to depict King David as being fully human. Someone that is tempting after things that, they, that is not meant for him to have and is above the blessings that God has already given him. It tells us about human nature at the same time that it tells us about the nature of the divine. Now, God, by all rights, should have put King David to death. That, in his own, um, by his own admission, is what should happen to someone who is a murderer. But God says, do you repent? 
And it says that King David repents, he admits everything that he's done, he seeks, uh, he repents, meaning that he, he turns away from his actions and he says, what do I have to do to make this right? Now again, with a, a, a note that women are often treated poorly in the Bible because they're depicted almost as if chattel, right? As if they're only sole possessions. In the telling of the story, God balances the scales a little bit. He says, from this day forth, King David, your wives will be taken away, your children will be taken away. All the things that you reached beyond the blessings that I gave you will be taken away. Why weren't you satisfied? This is the question that God asks. I gave you everything. Why weren't you satisfied? But because you admitted your wrongfulness, you admitted the sinful things that you'd done, I'm not going to be a God who is an eye of an eye for an eye justice. I'm being going to be a God who has mercy and compassion. God extends his grace to King David. And remember what grace is. Grace is when we get what we don't deserve, but God gives it to us anyways. God gives grace to King David. He's merciful, but he says, from this point onward, you are going to be a just ruler. You are going to defend those who are weak and vulnerable. And never again in your kingdom will you make, uh, have situations where those in power can manipulate others. And so the story ends that way. And then we as listeners are asked, well, what does this mean for us? Why do we need to go to church and hear such an awful story that seems to have a somewhat happy ending, I guess, I suppose, unless you're a woman and treated poorly in it? And I think it, what it does is it does two things. It says a little bit about us, and it says a little bit about God. It's like holding up a mirror to our situation. In short, it reveals that from the poorest to the poor, all the way up to kings and presidents, the tendency towards temptation and corruption exists for all people. But God's justice has a way of shining through the injustices of our world. God's light shines into the character flaws of our sinfulness, and God always wants us to strive to do better. The punchline of this parable, of this story, is that God's eyes never miss the places where the vulnerable are exploited. God sees in our hearts, and he tries to guide us in acts of repentance, where we turn away from the things that we know are wrong, and we, we struggle to do the things that are always right. And the final word that is the surprise at the end of the story, where King David deserved to be greatly punished with the loss of his life, because he repents, in God there is always forgiveness. And the question is whether or not we make the choice to give up a wrong path and choose the right one, and to admit that fault in God's eyes. So if there can be grace for the kings and beggars, there's grace for everyone in between, you and I, is the message of this story. And to God's justice and mercy, may our response always be, thanks be to God. Amen. continues the bottom of page 12 and I invite you as you're comfortable to stretch your legs and stand and may we too confess our faith in the words of the Apostles Creed as we say I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary he suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Can I have a chair out for you?
Oh, come on up. Uh, why don't we sit uh, for the prayers of the people? Jesus is the bread of life who satisfies our hunger and sustains us in our journey to heaven. Let us pray to the God who loves us, knows our needs, and provides for us. When I say, Lord, in your love, please pray with me, hear our prayer. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. As traveling people of God, we pray for a deepening hunger for the things of God and loosening of our grip on all the wants and expectations which prevent us from moving forward God's way. We pray for sensitivity, courage, and for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the people of God all over the world and in all worship traditions. For a readiness to be changed and made new, for a softening of the ground of our hearts to receive without fear. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. We pray for the leadership of our church, for Todd, Bishop of Huron, Bill, Bishop of Ontario, Anne, our Metropolitan, Linda, our Primate, Christopher, National Indigenous Archbishop, and Marinez, Bishop of Amazonia, our sister diocese, and the Primate of Brazil. We pray for all bishops, priests, and lay leaders in our church for God's support of their leadership. Build us up by the power of your spirit into the spiritual temple for you are glorified day after day in all our praise and worship and in our love for one another. Lord, in your love, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. As brothers and sisters with the whole of creation, we pray for respect and reverence among people, regardless of wealth or status, for responsible sharing of resources and consideration for the natural world of our fragile and beautiful planet. Lord, in your love, hear, hear our, prayer. our prayer. As we prepare and eat our food each day, we pray for those who grow and manufacture it, distribute it and sell it, shop for it and cook it, and for those with whom we share food. Build us up with your spiritual feeding, which sustains us forever. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. As we ask for daily bread, we pray for those who are physically starving, for all who hunger emotionally, or try to survive on spiritual junk food, for those who mistrust God's feeling. We all call to mind those whose eyes are wet with tears or tense with pain. Help them to sense your reassuring love, which can bring us through the darkest of valleys. We pray for the church family who are sick or have asked for prayer Edith, Edith, Chris, Chris, Rick, Rick, Michelle, Michelle, Jackie, Jackie, Ruth, Ruth, Howard, Howard, John, John, and Kieran, Kieran. We pray for others who have asked for prayers and those whose names are known in our hearts and to you, Lord. Lord, in your love, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for all who are affected by the many wildfires across the country, those who fear the threat of evacuation, and those who have been displaced. We pray for the many brave souls who are risking their lives to bring those fires under control, and we pray for the miracle of rain to bring relief. 
Lord, in your love, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. As we remember with love those who have journeyed through physical death, we pray that, nourished by the bread of life, they may travel on eagle's wings into the brightness of eternal life. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. As we grow increasingly aware of our spiritual hunger, we give thanks for the wonder of God's feeding throughout our days. Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today we have uh, another transition that's taking place in our St. George's community. Our seminarian, Brian Kenwell, who has been uh, serving in this church and has been going to school at Huron University College in London uh, for the last two years, is answering God's call uh, to a new diocese and to a new place of service. Uh, on Thursday, Brian will be shipping out uh, to the Diocese of Kapal in Saskatchewan to serve a mighty community of 500 people uh, as he is a lay pastor to that congregation and a second congregation and continues to do his last year of seminary remotely uh, online. Uh, it's been a blessing to have Brian, uh, to be surrounding him with prayers and to raise him up for ministry and service. I wanted to let Brian give a, have a moment to tell us exactly where he's going and who he's serving. Yeah, so I'll be, I'll be going to the Pindies of Beachy is actually where I'm moving. Um, so yeah, town of 500 for that one. Um, and I'll also be serving in the community in Kyle as well, um, which is about 150-200. Um, so nice small parishes to get started with, and it'll be lots of fun, I'm sure. <laughs> Host a corn roast, and you can meet everyone in the community. <laughs> uh, let us uh, take a moment uh, to send Brian on his way with prayer. Brian, I'd ask you to stand. The Lord be with you. Also. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for your servant, Brian. We give thanks for the big heart that calls him to offer himself in ministry. We ask you to bless him, to enable him and protect him as he travels to serve a new flock in a new diocese. Help him in his learning and raise him up so that one day he may be a servant priest in his church and serving in the Anglican Church of Canada. All this we ask and your blessing upon him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Our service continues on the bottom of page 13. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love. He is infinite in mercy and he welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us offer up our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all of your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. <laughs> Amen. And may the peace of the Lord, which passes all understanding, be with you this day and always. And I invite you to turn and, and wave the sign of peace to all those who are gathered with you in our cozy congregation today. God's peace to everyone. This morning's offertory hymn is Eat This Bread, Drink This Cup, and as you're comfortable, I would invite you to stand. <laughs> Oh, 
Jesus bread, drink this cup, trust in me and you will not burst. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, but this is the bread come down from heaven. Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to me and never be hungry. And never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, trust in me, and you will not thirst. The Lord be with you. God, our sustainer, accept all that we offer you on this day and feed us continually with that bread which satisfies all hunger your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And I invite you to please be seated for the Eucharist. Right. Gracious and loving God, I'm not worthy to serve at your altar, but only to say the word, and I shall be healed. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our prayer comes from the Church of England with the words found in your bulletin on page 16. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Almighty God, good Father to us all, your face is turned towards your world. In love you have given us Jesus, your Son, to rescue us from sin and death. Your word goes out to call us home to the city where angels sing your praise. Therefore, let us join with them in heaven's song as we sing. Heavenly Father of all, we give you thanks for every gift that comes from heaven. To the darkness, Jesus came as your light. With signs of faith and words of hope, he touched untouchables with love, and he washed the guilty clean. This is his story. This is our song, Hosanna in the highs. The crowds came out to see your son, yet at the end they turned on him. On the night he was betrayed, he came to table with his friends to celebrate the freedom of your people. This is his story. This is our song. Hosanna. Nice. Jesus blessed you, Father, for the food. He took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it and said, This is my body given for you all.
Jesus then gave thanks for the wine. He took the cup, gave it, and said, This is my blood shed for you all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. This is our story. This is our song. Hosanna in the highest. Therefore, Heavenly Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the cross on which your Son died to set us free. Defying death, he rose again and is alive with you to plead for all of us and for all the world. This is our story. This is our song. Hosanna. Send your Holy Spirit upon us now, that these gifts we may feed on Christ with opened eyes and hearts on fire. May we and all who share this food offer ourselves to live for you and to be welcomed at your feast in heaven where all creation worships you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And together we say, blessing and honor and glory and power be yours forever and ever. And as our ta Savior taught us, so we are bold to pray. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Okay. Thanks be to God. Okay. And Brian, if you have your hands washed, what we're going to do, just to keep things quick, is we're going to come to you for communion. And so, since there are four of us, we will <laughs> divide and conquer. <laughs> That probably works. And I've already done the hands. Brian, if you with Caroline uh, do everyone on the left-hand side, Donna and I will do the other side. The body of Christ, broken in love for you. given in love.
As you are comfortable, please join with me in standing. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. God of grace, today we have shared in the mystery of the body and blood of Christ. May we who have tasted the bread of life live with you forever. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we say thank you to God in these words as we say, Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love and pray for this day and always. Amen. And again, sticking with our garden imagery for the music today, our closing hymn is, In the Bulb There is a Flower. Sending you off. God of mission and renewal, may the faith that sustains us and the love that you have shared with us spill out beyond the walls of this sacred space. Equip and enable us to speak of our relationship with you to others and to invite them to come and see for themselves. This we pray in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you all for joining us for our first Garden of Remembrance service. Uh, we'll be here in this place, weather permitting, with the odd shower at the 8 o'clock congregation uh, for the entire month of August. And again, as you kind of know, the sun moves and sets next, year, uh, next uh, week. Bring your big hats. <laughs> uh, there is coffee and goodies in the front porch. Uh, May and Mary look like they're bringing them to you. 
And if you haven't had a chance to see our beautiful monument of remembrance, please do take a moment to see it as well. Blessings to all in your week, and we'll see you soon.